We're at Connected Britain 2019 and I'm with Mike Rudd, Head of Telecommunication Strategy at the UK Space Agency. Mike, what are the key opportunities for the UK from the rollout of high capacity digital infrastructure? Well, I think the key opportunity is that actually we've got a blank canvas. There are so many things that we just don't understand that we can do with the infrastructure that's going to be deployed. So if we look at um, the equivalence between um, phones where you could just text and the smartphones that we've got now, there's been an absolute massive explosion in the way that we use those smartphones. And actually just making calls and texting people is only a tiny, tiny part of that. So the fact that we've got, um, let's say, for argument's sake, limitless connectivity and the ability to move data and information and analyse that wherever we want, whenever we want. The only thing that limits us is the imagination. So you can, from my perspective as a, as a government, um, as, as, as a government body, you can do, you can force all the, sorry, I didn't mean to say force, you can move all the um, digital services right to the edge of the network so that people can do um, agri-tech and healthcare and, connecti and connectivity in terms of cars, entertainment, automation, machine to machine, right there at the edge. The, the, it really is boundless in, in terms of what we can do. And I think we're only touching the surface at the moment in terms of the use cases that we think we've got for that connectivity. And is full fibre and 5G a realistic goal for the UK? Um, I don't think so, but I don't think that's desirable. You've got to look at the economic case. It costs money to roll fibre out um, to where people are not. It costs money to roll um, mobile infrastructure out to where people are not. So I think it's all about the end user and what they need to do and what the use case is that sat around that. And that's where satellite comes in as part of that mix. Um, to be able to watch, I don't know, Netflix between London and Cornwall, you're going to need to be able to switch between fibre connectivity, Wi-Fi and mobile to get you through the, the whole length of that journey. So it needs to be the appropriate infrastructure for the appropriate use case, for the appropriate um, location. There is absolutely no reason why you want to put fibre in the middle of, I don't know, the Welsh mountains, for example. But actually, there's a critical use case there in terms of, in terms of safety and, 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 and mountain rescue. And that's where maybe satellite could come in, or in more rural areas, but not at that point, where, where mobile would come in. And what's your predictions for the next 12 months? Wow. Well, my predictions um, for the next 12 months are that we're going to see, and we're starting to see it already, a lot more collaboration between those different infrastructure types. Um, I think it's um, interesting that uh, mobile operators are starting to work with um, certainly the satellite industry in terms of those connected car use cases where you need to be able to switch between um, those individual um, services. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot more focus on that end-to-end -end service delivery. So I think that um, business models are going to change to reflect that. So. I think that the growth and the demand is going to be driven in the same way that smartphones have. Um, I think that the, um, that is the, the demand and the growth and the way that we react to the infrastructure provision is going to be driven by those use cases and those users. And how can satellites offer the flexibility and responsiveness to meet the demand? Well, um, satellites have got, a, have got a bad press, I think. Um, Satellites are traditionally seen as expensive, slow, limited, and effectively uh, communications of, of last resort. And I think that's justified, but that's, 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 that's an old view. Um, satellites, and I keep coming back to mobile phones, it's, a, it's akin to the move from the, from the old phones to the smartphones. We're seeing a lot more flexible technology. Um, we're, we're in the process and the final stages of, of getting to launch for um, the quantum, pardon me, the quantum satellite, for example, which is the world's first completely re reconfigurable satellite. So instead of setting the mission at the start of the program, and then that will go up in the air and it would stay there for 15 years, the um, 
the payload has been designed so you can reconfigure it for any use um, through, its, through its useful life. So we're going to see a lot more flexibility um, in terms of what you can do in terms of satellite. So it's not just going to be flat pipe, up, uh, sorry, bent pipe up and down, which is effectively what comes in, what comes out. There's going to be a lot more processing, a lot more reconfiguration, <coughs> and a lot more analytics going on on board. But we're also seeing an explosion in the small sat market. Now, the small sat market is very interesting because of the turnover rate. So instead of, if you, if you imagine a geo satellite being a truck that you buy for 10 years and then you scrap it, a small sat is like a laptop, which you should change 12 to 18 months. And every time you put another satellite, a small satellite, into orbit, it's the next generation. So the, instead of having a 15 year gap between technology refresh, that technology refresh is going on and on continually and that capability is getting better and better and we're starting to see those move from the traditional science demonstrators now to wider applications uh, earth observation is is ripe for exploitation in small sats but the um, we're starting to see them now in terms of telecoms and because they're cheap to put up in 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 orbit and because they are cheap to produce you can put up tens hundreds of thousands to make a, a complete telecoms constellation with a similar delay that you will see between getting um, data by fiber from the UK to the US. So it puts them right in that telecoms market which gives you an additional uh, dimension to that whole connectivity toolbox that involves fiber and mobile too. Sounds great, what are the biggest challenges to achieving all this? Well, one of them is domestically um, but I think um, hopefully people have seen the announcement last week that we've um, that we've uh, we're looking to create a ministerial space council and a national uh, national space framework, which will um, raise the profile of space within um, within within government and try and uh, look to move space so that it's got equal visibility and buying from other government departments. There are a huge amount of government departments that use space but actually don't realise that they're doing it. DEFRA and, and the Department for International Development are two key ones. Um, so DEFRA use a lot of environmental information from space and DEFRA use that in terms of the d disaster relief overseas. <coughs> Excuse me. But that will give us a completely new structure in terms of governance and access to other departments. We're aligning quite closely with um, with, with, with defence, um, which we which um, is really key because they are, they've got the major telecommunications satellite procurement um, over the next ten years. Um, I think fundamentally the challenges around that user experience that I've already mentioned and how we meet. As a, as a community, not just in space, how we meet those user challenges. And one of the things that we want to try and focus on in, in, in the space agency and in the telecommunications arena is 5G. Fi, uh, 5G and the space industry traditionally haven't got on that well because of, the, um, because of the perceptions, but also because of the technology lag within space. But we're working with ESA and we're working with the EU to see how, with the developments that we've got through small sats and the new space sector and the developments in the, in the traditional space sector, how we can deliver uh, and support 5G for the benefit of, of, of the UK and society in general. Great, and why is it important for the UK Space Agency to be an event like Connected Britain here today? So, this is absolutely uh, fundamental to what we do. Um, we attended last year for the first time and it was interesting in the reaction that we got. Um, we were moving into what's traditionally a terrestrial world and um, we were perceived as a bit of a threat. I think this year um, we've seen a complete sea change in that. Um, the stand has been really busy, the team have worked really hard and I think there's a recognition that, um, that space does form part of that um, seamless infrastructure. 
But I think for us, it's good in terms of reaching out and understanding what is driving the market, what is driving the thoughts, what is the thought leadership around the mobile industry, the regulatory industry, and the, uh, and the, and the terrestrial industry. And actually, what is the perception of space and how we could possibly change that um, and work together. This is all about working collaboratively. It's not about space is a threat to fiber or copper or Wi-Fi or mobile. It's about how can we make this better so that UK can benefit and we can realize the benefits from 5G. Thank you, it's really interesting. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here.